Council. Welcome, guests. Ready when you are, Hannah. Okay. Well, welcome to tonight's uh, City Council meeting. Today is Tuesday, August the 2nd. We are streaming live on uh, the City of Madison YouTube channel. We have a good agenda tonight with lots of uh, important things on, on in store for us. Uh, as in past meetings, we'll stand, bow our heads, remove our hats, and recite the Lord's Prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Abigail, may we have a roll call, please? Savinal. Here. Krebs. Here. Lucy Dottillo. Here. Schaefer. Here. Chatham. Here. Dan Dottillo. Here. We have one member absent tonight, Scoob's absent, Councilman Bartlett. Council, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes from July 19th? If so, we'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I move to adopt the minutes as written. We have a second. I second the motion. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you like to introduce uh, or welcome to the podium Hannah Fagan, who is our Director of Community Relations. Talk about our intern appreciation. Hello, Council. Um, I'm going to go ahead and invite the interns up to the front of the room. Abby Hill, you can come join us. So the city of Madison has had an internship program for quite some time. Um, over the last year, we've kind of refined that. We have an application process. We have um, an interview process that our interns go through. And that started with our spring intern, Clarice uh, Shaley, who is a graduate of Hanover and now works for a radio station in Tennessee. Um, so this is our larger class. The summertime will always have a larger class. Um, and these interns have worked on a variety of things this summer. Uh, the lights you see on Main Street, including the star lights, those were hung by um, a handful of the interns here. It was probably not their favorite experience being out in the dead heat of summer hanging lights on Main Street and was not expected, but our street department was super busy with regatta, so they helped with that. Um, some of the information that you see coming out of the newsletter has been handled by our communication intern, Jacob. Uh, Neil, he works in our parks department, so some of those Facebook posts you see coming from the parks department is coming from him. Um, he's helped with just some organization of their calendar and their website. Um, Abby Fulton over here, she is our policy intern this year, and she has worked on a variety of things, including a putting together a piece of work for a mayor's um, youth council, which will be hopefully on the agenda next next council meeting. Um, needs some review from Bob and Mindy first. And then Abby Hill, who, has been, who was actually my intern last spring, is now Katie Rampey's intern. And she does other cool things other than taking roll call in minutes. <laughs> I'm sure Katie can share what she's t what else she does, but we're just bringing them here today um, to recognize them for their hard work this summer. We really have a great class this year. We're really appreciative of all the work they've done, and um, Bob's a little disappointed in their pop culture knowledge, uh, so he said they need to come back with better pop culture it's knowledge. The fun of the learning curve. Yeah, um, so. I hear Chris Hills kind of failed with Abby. She didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was. Um, 
So other than that, the interns have been fabulous. So we have some certificates just to recognize them for their work. So um, first up is Neil Mystery, and Neil is going off to IU to study biology. He'll be a s entering as a senior, and he is also hoping to get into med school. So he's, again, our Parks Communications intern. So thank you, Neil. <laughs> Next up, we have Jacob Smith, uh, junior, correct? at Ball State, and he is an organizational communication major, and he's been our communication major, so we appreciate you. <laughs> and your sense of humor. Um, next up, we have Abby Fulton, your sophomore, the, correct, at Butler University, and she is studying um, political science, and I, I forgive me, this, yes, peace and conflict studies, so she's been a great policy intern. Her work, her research has been fabulous. Thank you, Abby. And last, we have Abigail Hill, who is going to be a sophomore at Purdue University studying tourism, hospitality and tourism. So thank you, Abby. So thank you all to our interns. I just want to say thank you to all the interns. They really made uh, the summer really interesting. Uh, they brought a lot of energy to City Hall and um, a great, great work product too, I might add, um, leveraging their skill set and also just seeing um, these, these young people with a um, desire to serve the community. Oh, sorry, serve the community was also really, really great. But uh, Again, just another fun, uh, just fun group of people to work with. Moving on, I would like to uh, invite uh, Carrie Ketman, uh, the executive director of, of Safe Passage, to our podium and and let her say a few things about the role Safe Passage has had and, and the impact across the the communities. And and they're also celebrating their 25th anniversary. And I have a proclamation uh, to read. Uh, but welcome, welcome, City Council. Thank you. Carrie. Thanks for having me. Um, as you know, Jefferson County is one of six counties that Safe Passage serves. We provide des domestic violence and sexual assault intervention and prevention services in all of those counties. We really like getting down to Madison and Jefferson County because of just an extraordinary amount of support. I was talking briefly with the mayor ahead of this and we see the most crisis calls out of Jefferson County. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's the most domestic violence here or sexual assault here as much as it means that you're getting the word out about the services that we provide. So all of our services are free, they're confidential, um, and they're voluntary. While our shelter facility is in uh, Batesville in uh, Ripley County, we have non-residential staff here, um, and oftentimes part of their safety planning may be to go in for a night or a weekend or around a court hearing or different things like that. So um, so the people here in this community are uh, welcome to use that facility and also get non-residential services. So 25 years ago, my predecessor, um, Jane Yorn, who you guys might be familiar with and other council uh, meetings. She uh, founded with a with a group of her friends um, Safe Passage. So that's part of why I'm here this evening is because uh, the, your city has has welcomed us with a proclamation to kind of mark that 25th anniversary. Over that time, we've served over 16,000 people. Um, we average about 1,200 uh, um, last year and uh, we continue to do the work where the work takes us and meet people where they're at with their needs. So um, Jane uh, went on to become our executive director for the past 11 years um, and she just retired in June. So I was actually on board back when the shelter opened. I left for city government in the city of Lawrenceburg in uh, Dearborn County. So I kind of know the drill with council meetings and different things from that perspective, and I also know how incredibly important your support is, even if it's just word of mouth to get, you know, 
people that you know or care about to our services. So I'm here to say thank you, and I really appreciate the fact Carrie, that if you'll let me, I'll read this proclamation, proclamation and uh, declaring Safe Passage Month, August 2022, whereas Safe Passage has provided support services for domestic and sexual violence victims and their children since 1997. The nonprofit serves on average 1,300 victims and their and their children in Dearborn, Ohio, Ripley, Franklin, Switzerland, and Jefferson counties per year. 16,000 victims and their children have been helped by safe passage over the past 25 years. One in three women and one in six men will be a victim at some point, and the need for service continues. Whereas Safe Passage has a 30-bed shelter, a toll-free text and call helpline with live support 24-7, 365 days a year, and services for those needing support in the community, including safety planning, legal advocacy, medical accompaniment, education support group, and resource referrals. Whereas Jefferson County is consistently in the top serve for hotline and helpline calls and service of the six county service region, all services are free, voluntary, and confidential. Two full-time staff work uh, the Safe Passage satellite office in Madison at the Clearinghouse to better serve local clients. Safe Passage prevention programming is provided to build assets, teach youth about healthy relationships, and deliver consent and bystander education. Prevention coordination is available in Jefferson to serve uh, local schools and to help prevent the cycle of violence. Therefore, in recognition of 25 years of service, uh, I, Bob Courtney, Mayor of the City of Madison, hereby proclaim August 2022 Safe Passage Month, and we invite all citizens to, to join us in this occasion. And, and Carrie, we thank you guys so much. You're part of that critical uh, social safety net that we need in our community and across our across our region. So for this, this proclamation. Thank you. Turn uh, this part of the agenda over to our council. The first ordinance on the agenda is ordinance number 2022-15, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending certain portions of the City of Madison Ordinance 2008-16. Whereas the City of Madison previously adopted Ordinance 2008-16 to establish a fund for disaster mitigation funds and now finds it necessary to amend such an ordinance to allow for other monies to be deposited in said fund for the purposes of disaster mitigation. Whereas the City of Madison desires to amend the previously described ordinance in order to deposit the $250,000 contribution from the Jefferson County, from Jefferson County for the purposes of flood disaster mitigation. And now therefore be it ordained by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, that ordinance 2008-16 section one is hereby amended to allow for the deposit of funds and reimbursement from the federal, from the federal emergency management administration, also known as FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, Lilly Endowment through Jefferson County United Way, and any other government agency or entity that may wish to contribute funds, the ordinance shall become immediately effective upon, upon its adoption by the Common Council. Signature of the mayor, enrollment in the book of ordinances, and publication as required by law. Any ordinance in conflict with this ordinance is hereby repealed, and all remaining aspects of the ordinance shall be replaced. Uh, just a little background of history. If I recall right, uh, this ordinance was established and done, uh, I believe, back in 2008 around a flood that happened and occurred at that point in time for the deposit of these monies. The only thing we're really adding is the last portion there where it says any other government agency or entity that may wish to contribute funds that allows us to give us a little more flexibility with whom which we can receive funds from and deposit this. So. Right, and council, this is first reading, but uh, a copy of the original ordinance is also in your books uh, for from the original one in 2008. And I want to uh, thank Jefferson County for the contribution to, of the $250,000 that will go toward our uh, flood uh, mitigation efforts. Moving on, uh, are, there, are there any reports, recommendations, or other business from standing or select study committees of City Council? I, I know their uh, traffic committee uh, meeting has been scheduled for August the 9th at 5.30, so appreciate everybody's participation there. We'll have a couple of things on that agenda. 
moving on, we'll uh, invite uh, Tony and Alyssa up to introduce the Riverfront Liquor License application for Red Bicycle Hall. So as the mayor stated, um, this is going to be the application for Red Bicycle under the cultural experience venue. Um, the Red Bicycle Hall has met or exceeded the requirements that were established in Resolution 2022-39C. This includes having a minimum performance capacity of 125 people and abiding by the state minimum food requirements. This venue will attract tourists through their live performances as well as enhance the quality of life in Madison. Through renovations and improvements to the facility, they plan to be the first they plan to be a first-class music hall and hope to compete with other venues in the surrounding region. Red Bicycle plans to continue to use this space for live music and begin to use it for weddings and parties. Currently, any show or <coughs> event held at the Red Bicycle Hall are set up and tore down by the owners and their spouses, but they have recently hired a wedding event coordinator and intend to hire a bartender if approved by the council. After meeting with the administration, we recommend that the council give consent for the Red Bicycle Hall's liquor license. And then I'll enter... Um, I'll introduce Kevin and Charles as the representative for any questions. Welcome. Well, welcome. Uh, we, we are all very familiar with Red Bicycle and uh, seriously the origins of Madison's music movement, I might add, uh, in recent, recent history. But uh, feel free to describe anything you guys want to with regard to Red Bicycle Hall, particularly the collaboration you're having with other organizations and venues that are promoting music uh, to create the culture of Indiana's Music City. Uh, absolutely. Kevin Watkins for Red Bicycle Hall. And as Alyssa indicated, we've been doing this for some time. Um, we opened the venue with the intention of being a music hall primarily. We have been doing weddings and other events, uh, social events, um, as, as well as some uh, community um, enhancement and, and uh, assistance, I guess, with, I don't know, candidate, <coughs> candidate forums and, and uh, different board meetings and such. Uh, we are also partners uh, with the Madison Music Movement, M3. Uh, we have also assisted in, in booking and and uh, participating in activities in the Ohio Theater, which we're very excited to see come on board. Uh, we see ourselves as a community partner, um, not a competitor uh, with other venues in this community. And so as other venues have come on board, we want to see the, the water rise, as you will, all tides. Uh, as the tide comes in, all boats will float higher, I suppose. So uh, we're looking forward to that. I, I believe that, um, that we might could be considered the poster child for this particular amendment to the riverfront license uh, as we're not specifically a food venue we're also not specifically a bar uh, we're not open for patrons to just come in uh, our primary interest is entertainment and uh, social activities and if there's a cocktail or, or a beer or wine to be had uh, during those events we sure appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be able to share that with the public so uh, just anecdotally a couple weeks ago, we had a we had a show in a guy named John Moreland. You were at that show, weren't you? I was you? there. Yeah. And interestingly, uh, you probably saw this too. Two thirds, three quarters. I mean, everybody was from out of town. I mean, it, it really functions as a nexus for. I don't think people realize how how many people come in and, and discover I, the town. And I, I was going to describe Red Red Bike as a regional music destination because, and I was going to use that as an example because three fourths of the people there. Uh, a were a lot younger than me, so that just shows you the following of, of John Moreland, and and then uh, secondly, they were all from out of town, which was great because I know they were coming in for, you know, to do things other than just see the show. Um, but uh, I want to congratulate you guys on the investment and the vision you had with Red Bike, and uh, many, many, many more years to come and success. Council, any questions for our applicant representatives here? Or for Alyssa? Here now we'll entertain a motion to approve. I move to granting. I move to consent to the Riverfront Liquor License application for Red Bicycle Hall. A second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. 
Thank you, Captain. Charlie, Caroline, thank you guys very much. Tony, were there any more updates you wanted to give on economic development? Not at this time. Not this time. Okay, we'll move on to Director of Planning. Nicole Shell has quite a bit here. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I want to give a just brief overview for the department, and then I'll move into the presentation. Um, as some of you know, uh, Scott Gross, our previous building inspector, has uh, resigned. Uh, so we hired uh, Landon Ralston as the new building inspector. He's been on the job for about uh, two, three weeks, uh, part-time, and then um, in a couple of weeks he'll go full-time as he's completing some jobs as a contractor. I want to give an update on some of our grant projects that are going on. Uh, Clifty Drive is currently undergoing uh, right-of-way purchasing and engineering. Uh, those plans, uh, final plans, will be uh, given to NDOT in mid-August. Uh, we completed the Park Master Plan and Preservation Quest grants. And then uh, projects in uh, the works, uh, we'll give a ready update uh, via the presentation in a minute. Uh, but we started construction upstairs as part of our National Trust grant. Uh, we're restoring the area that has the bay window um, out front uh, for future use as office space once we get the funds for an elevator. Uh, so that project includes just uh, completing the flooring, walls, and windows. Um, the city was recently awarded a Paul Brunn grant um, from the National Park Service. We're waiting for that grant agreement from um, them before we finalize the uh, process and application for those funds. Those funds will be used to uh, complement our city's PACE program uh, focused on those who can't financially afford the match. And then uh, last grant that we're currently working on is for the Historic District Design Guidelines. Uh, we hired a consultant through a um, historic preservation grant through the state, and uh, the historic board's currently accepting comments on those. Those will eventually come before you for approval. And there's much more on my uh, report, uh, but you have a printed copy there for you. Uh, so now into the fun. Hey, Nicole, may I ask a quick question sure. on that report? And that was just the timing on. Uh, the updated historic district survey and guidelines, what's the timetable that we're on for those? So the things? survey, uh, updated survey uh, that the city's uh, funding locally um, has been completed. Uh, they are completing the final draft of the report that we had out for public comment for the last two weeks. We haven't received any public comments on those. Uh, so once that draft report is uh, given to me, I'll put it online as well as the <coughs> link to the new survey, um, it's all digital, uh, so anyone will be able to go on that link, search their house, and see all the historic information for it, as well as what rating it is. And then the design guidelines, like I said, they're currently going through public comments at the historic board level. Uh, we asked and was awarded an extension on our grant uh, to the end of the year. Are those guidelines available on the website? Yes, they are. All 150 pages worth. <laughs> But it's good. It's a good doc. It's a good document. I thought. Of course, my clicker is not going to work. It worked earlier, but we'll uh, just manually do it. Uh, so the, probably our biggest grant uh, right now is through the Ready program. Um, as some of you know, the city submitted an application to the, our Southern Indiana RDA um, late, uh, mid last year for our destination development projects as well as our workforce uh, development program. Uh, those were uh, submitted to the RDA. We went through a process with the state and our region, uh, which is five counties, was awarded the $50 million, uh, which is one, th one of the max awards or one of five RDAs to receive that. Uh, so the process um, since then, the RDA has been formalizing how they're going to distribute that money. In July, uh, they came up with a mechanism to award uh, money based on their scoring uh, requirements. The RDA gave about $2.6 million to the city's destination Madison project that it was about 65% of what we requested. 
Um, it's a total of six projects, so only three of our six will receive ready funds. That doesn't mean that the other three won't be completed. It will just be funding from other sources, whether it's um, city funds, um, redevelopment funds, or private investment. So I'm going to go over this uh, three uh, primary projects. The first is the 421 Gateway Project. Um, as you know, the city recently required three parcels along the 421 Harrison Bridge um, entryway into Madison and the state of Indiana. This is what it currently looks like, a um, couple parking lots, a couple of dilapidated structures. And we're going to transform that into a really nice gateway green space uh, that will include some parking, uh, really class it up um, with some trees and landscaping. That parking area is designed for those who want to walk across the bridge, want to stop and take a picture in front of the uh, new arched gateway, um, welcome to Madison sign. Uh, we're going to have one uh, electric vehicle parking, one space uh, dedicated for golf carts, and then it's going to have a little nice plaza area for some seating, some other amenities such as bike racks, drinking fountain. Um, and then some signage, uh, one of the big signs that's like out in front of the comfort station that has the map, the list of the different um, businesses is going to be located on that plaza. This is one of the two projects that was uh, recently in the paper for uh, collecting bids. Uh, so we have a pre-bid meeting uh, next Monday and the Board of Public Works will open sealed bids at their next meeting on September 6th. Uh, assuming everything goes well with the awarding, uh, we presume to award to the lowest bidder. Uh, we'll start construction October 1st uh, with the plans to complete the project May 1st. As mentioned, this is one of our ready uh, projects that is receiving funding. We've asked for the RDA to award us ready funds to cover all of the construction cost. Uh, so the only city funds that will be in this project is the acquisition costs that have already been allocated and spent, as well as the design fees. So the construction cost is about 2.3 million. That was the estimate given by the design firm. Uh, we're hoping for a lower number from construction uh, bids. Any questions on that project before I move to the next one? I just have one question. Sure. Um, I don't know, and maybe I'm incorrect on this. Are, are golf carts even allowed on that road? They are not allowed on the state road, but this empties out into First Street. So we have the very end parking space allocated for, par for golf carts, so they'll be able to back straight up and go up First Street. So that's on the west side? And for Fillmore, too. Yeah. First, First Street's a one way through there, though, so there'd be no way for them to. They can cross. At 90 degrees, though. From where? From First Street. They can cross the state road at 90 degrees. No. Across the side of the street is what she's talking about. They can go across and go that way. <clears throat> but she's talking about. We'll need to update that golf cart ordinance because it's not a lighted intersection controlled by a traffic signal. Uh, That's the only way you can cross we, designated. We, Other than 421, we specifically spelled out <laughs> what intersections you could cross at. So. Is, and is, Fillmore is a two-way, so they can sure. come into that parking lot that way. Is, can we receive a copy of this? Yes. We're, we'll be putting this online, um, and then I'll provide a copy for um, you all. There wouldn't be any way for them to come in by Fillmore through those designs, though. Uh, it, it, it they'd have to get it. Again, they'd. this is a rendering, so it depends on what, how it's opened up to Fillmore back there. Right now, there's <laughs> proposed landscaping. But good point. We'll, we'll have to address to see if the golf cart ordinance allows that. Is that EV space planned to be metered? We're still negotiating, negotiating that. Um, we have a donor that is willing to donate uh, free uh, EV um, charging stations, uh, like what is over on Main Street. Um, but there was a recent change in state code that the city could charge.
The next of our three projects is the Mulberry Street Arts Corridor Parking Lot Enhancement Project. This is the parking lot that's right next to the new Kindness Mural at Mulberry and 2nd Street. We're planning to uh, redo that lot. It um, hasn't been updated for quite a while. And we really want to showcase the arts mural. So we're planning on adding a plaza, uh, giving folks the ability to stand in front of the mural, uh, really be able to see it um, full view without any trees or cars in the way, and also give them the opportunity to take selfies or pictures of the mural uh, if they choose. This area will also have a golf cart parking, dedicated spaces, and then two EV uh, charging um, spaces dedicated. So if, if there's a local business that wants to contribute a golf cart charger similar to the EV chargers, who would they contact? Uh, they can contact me and I'll put them in touch with our design team. Uh, there is electric through there, uh, so that shouldn't be an issue adding it. Okay. Are, will we have the same number of parking spots, more, less? It's a little bit less because of the plaza, uh, but we've uh, tightened the spaces just a little bit to uh, get in as many as we could. Okay. Do you know the number now versus how many? Will be I there? don't off the top of my head. Okay. I don't know if Tony recalls. I thought I thought it was three less, maybe three. It's, it's uh, I believe two to three less if you count the golf cart spaces. So. If you think about a golf cart space is sitting down there now taking up regular parking, it's a, it's a couple spaces less, like two. And there's also an additional handicap space that's been added. So if you take the UV, there's no UV, EV uh, spaces currently, but we added golf carts. Golf carts you take up about half of the space, so it roughly comes out about the same, which is something we try to do. How many so how many golf cart spaces? Ten, I believe. Okay, so we're taking up would be 10 car parking spots and no, putting in not. 10 golf cart spaces. No, you say you would golf, if you use the golf cart. If you, oh, if you, if yes. you consider the golf yes, cart spaces consider stored. Golf so carts today they're taking up 10, 10 car spaces. They would be really taking up five parking spaces today. Okay, so really we're losing about five. eight car parking no, spaces. No, we're, we're only losing two overall parking spaces. But, but if, if we exclude the golf cart parking because cars now can't park in the golf cart spaces, they're not mm. multi-use any longer. They'd sized for golf carts yeah I guess that would be a way to look at it the other way to look at it is golf carts aren't parking won't be parking in the car spaces which you see around it the other way to look at it they're freeing up car spaces that golf carts are using so but basically the overall parking now is still the same okay In addition to improving the Mulberry Street parking lot, we added the Main Street Comfort Station. Um, if you are familiar with Comfort Station, the gravel lot behind it is actually city property. And so we're going to add landscaping, uh, pave that parking lot, stripe it, and add uh, security lights so that it's well lit. <coughs> Is there any access to the building from the back side there? There will be, yes. There so uh, there's going to be a ramp that leads up to where the stairs currently are that goes down uh, south. Um, so you'll have both handicap access <coughs> as well as sidewalk leading to that. But the doors case. will still be in the front? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, one other thing, too, this, this parking lot, was this area of town was identified as having a need for additional parking in the parking study that was presented earlier in the year. So this will help. Uh, with uh, additional parking in a part of town that the parking is <coughs> identified as a need for parking. Will there be any signage added up on Main Street directing people back to yeah, it? Yeah, so we, we are working uh, currently on an implementation plan for wayfinding or parking signage to help help with uh, parking downtown. That was one of the recommendations as well as out of, out of that parking study. So you'll see more of that in the coming months. For, for all of our For lots. all of the lots. Okay. Does either one of this one or the previous one have cost estimates yet? Yes, I'll get to that in just a sec. May I ask just one more question? Sure. Yeah, these two so am I right for this particular parking lot, the only access are two alleyways? Mm-hmm. And Main Street. And it's, you, you'd, no, you'd have, have to turn to from Main Street yeah, onto, onto an, an alley. alley. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to turn from Main Street onto an alley to access it. Mm -hmm. Is Would that give safe access to this parking? It should. Yeah, I see people turn down there all the time right now. 
It's usually the people from the financial office right next door that park back there. <coughs> is the lighting for this lot going to be positioned in a way to not affect any of the neighboring residences? Yes, it's going to, there are going to be spotlights from the building and they're going to be facing down towards the concrete. So it will be just enough that it's lit up so uh, if someone's hanging out there, the police will be easy, easy to see them, but not enough to bother the neighbors. I would also uh, remind the council, this was a project the comfort station, this parking lot was designed with the comfort station, but was cut out back a, a number of years ago. Um, and uh, we do have alleyway improvements planned for those alleyways around the, the comfort station. Also, uh, one, sorry, one other question. Um, is there going to be any kind of screen put in? Um, I guess that'd be on the west side between the two buildings yeah. yes okay yep so that you won't be able to walk through there like you can now um, okay. I believe it's just fencing that's going up through there okay thank you uh, this project has the exact same schedule as the previous one uh, it was also in the paper for the notice to bidders uh, sealed bids will be open September 6th at the BPW meeting with construction starting October 1st and then as long as everything goes well with uh, materials, uh, we plan to open this uh, for parking May 1st. Uh, so this budget uh, for both uh, the Mulberry Street parking and Main Street parking lots, uh, we've asked the RDA to fund the full construction of both projects, uh, which is just under 900,000 uh, estimated. Uh, so the city's only investment in this project is the design fees. Just want to mention one thing about the ready. That is, um, this is all about leveraging our potential as a regional destination. There were two plans, as Nicole talked about, uh, the workforce development plan, which is primarily hilltop centric, and that included. You know, what you'll see now, two projects have already broken ground, the Super ATV expansion, as well as uh, the mixed-use development, uh, which will be shopping and housing. But it's also part of just a broader, you know, destination development for the city of Madison and uh, the 40-some-odd partnerships that we had created when we made that, made that application. We asked for a, a lot more money. Uh, they distilled it down through the scoring process, and then, and then the funding actually dictated this level, but we're also happy to report that another project that we supported was the Hanover College Ivy Tech collaboration, which is the um, the new vet tech uh, clinic uh, teaching center that will be at Hanover College. That's a multi-million dollar project. They received almost six million dollars in funding for that. So we're outlining, you know, the few that we uh, were awarded for uh, Destination Madison. Jefferson County received almost 20 percent of the $50 million that was allocated to the region. So I think that we got a good share of the funding. But even though some of our plans weren't funded, uh, a lot of those partnerships are materializing in, you know, third party capital investments that's going to generate literally, like I said, a quarter billion dollars worth of new economic impact over the next three to five years here in Madison. So it's good, all good stuff. So like I mentioned, uh, we're going to have three projects that are receiving ready funds. The third project will be the Music City Amphitheater. Uh, we don't know how much ready funds we're going to receive for that project. It will be based off of what our construction costs come back from those bids for the other two. And then we'll use whatever remaining funds available for ready for the Music Amphitheater. And then we'll use other sources, uh, which Tony can touch on, um, to fund the rest of it. So as you remember, um, back when we did, the Redevelopment Commission had the bond issuance for the Madison Plaza and Super ATV. We talked about a Series B bonds that we, we put in position to help fund the ready match dollars uh, for our ready. At that time, we didn't know what we were getting from ready, but we knew we were going to need some match dollars. And so um, as we start to roll into the design for the um, Indiana Music City Amphitheater this fall, we'll identify that cost and, and we'll, we'll, we'll pursue issuance of Series B bonds through the Redevelopment Commission to fund the remaining ready projects. Where is that amphitheater? Where's the proposed site for that? Uh, Bicentennial Park. Basically, yeah, exactly. We're okay. in a very similar location to an existing uh, path. It's Southwest corner, basically. Yeah, it's the same, 
same location with the mat. And again, it's uh, it was originally designed to have a permanent amphitheater structure. Uh, this is finishing that. And as Indiana's Music City and the M3 movement, it makes perfect sense to have one of the permanent outdoor uh, amphitheater stages that will be able to do much more than just a band or, you know, they'll be able, we hope to have the acoustics set up in this facility to be able to bring in uh, a much higher level of quality, you know, sympathies and other things, uh, and potentially plays or Shakespeare in the parks and those sorts of activities. We'll be able then to have the kinds of facilities that those folks would request uh, to, to be able to consider Madison as, as a performance location. ready update I have for you is there any other questions I can answer I have one and maybe I'm remembering something from the parks side but on the gateway project mm -hmm. at one point was there going to be art included yes that is a future phase uh, that will be outside of ready um, it will be part of the city's match towards that project okay thank you of course and in terms of the public art component for the gateway project the Public Arts Commission is working on an RFQ currently for um, a call to artists that are native or current residents of the state of Indiana. We're working with the Indiana Arts Commission to develop that RFQ. Uh, they hope to issue that in September or October and have a call for artists by the end of the year and ultimately pick um, two or three artists to do a, a, a sample uh, for us and then ultimately choose from a design uh, to put at that uh, put at that gateway. And that gateway piece of art would currently be behind the sign. It was planned for as a part of the state highway project. The state okay. built the pedestal in and the lighting. Um, and then we'll, again, again, fund that through the ready dollars or the Series B, uh, the Series B bond. Okay. There's no other questions. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Many would like to give us an update before we move to the uh, public hearing. Good evening, Council. Uh, just a couple of quick updates for you because I've been pretty wrapped up in budget. So I uh, wanted to give you another update on Oak Hill. They're firmly in phase two. So believe they're getting ready to move back to Springwood and Meadowwood. That would be the two long roads in there. Um, I talked to Kenny this morning. There are some they're expected to have concrete work done by the end of August. They are on track to do that, but they are, Kenny is making them, you know, he's making sure that everything is to spec and he's got some places he's making them go take out and remove and redo, which is what we want. <laughs> so um, lots of good progress up there. If you have not been through there, um, I'd encourage you to take another drive through there and take a look at it. Um, we're moving on to park planning now, and I would like to, first of all, thank Matt Willard, Park Director, and Tony Steinhardt for um, help in gathering renderings and quotes, and uh, Kenny for talking to residents and finding out what's important to them. We've had calls from residents for and against certain pieces, so we're trying to put it all together and come up with a good idea for their park. And I would like to have Tony come up and talk about uh, some of the things that he has had done in a rendering for us. Uh, thank you, uh, Mindy. As Mindy said, it's been a good collaboration internally with the city, um, trying to um, develop a park that is one of the few neighborhood parks, if not the only neighborhood park on the hilltop, that really hasn't been touched uh, since it was built. Uh, there's sw swings there from the 1960s. Uh, quite honestly, uh, should have probably been taken out uh, because they're not uh, by current standards. So what we're doing with the help of some additional dollars that the city has, uh, has found, uh, some park dollars, uh, some redevelopment commission dollars, and then going to our community for a public-private partnership, um, we are working on redoing the park. Uh, it was identified in the park master plan. Uh, certainly we won't be as elaborate as that park master plan shows. But we think we can make a great impact uh, based upon the feedback we got from neighbors in helping them out. Um, we certainly will do uh, the new parks, sidewalks, basketball courts, and some additional parking uh, that they've requested. Um, a new shelter house in the center, uh, very similar to the pickleball court uh, shelter house. We know the cost of that, and it's a nice design pickle house. Uh, I'm sorry, a nice design pickle shelter house. Uh, 
the uh, playground, uh, we will we will fund that as well. And the rendering at the bottom of the back page shows you if you want to move forward. Nicole shows you an image of the of, of the potential playground structure uh, in the in the uh, dollar amounts that we can afford. We've also or the city's uh, only request to the community foundation this year uh, is for the Oak Hill neighborhood park and playground equipment uh, contribution. So we are submitting to the community foundation for a grant on that as well. Uh, the dog park has been requested uh, furniture and recreation items and then ultimately fencing. We currently have a, um, uh, in, uh, in, I'm sorry, an employer and an industrial employer here in town who's um, willing to help with that project. And uh, so we will be, uh, myself, uh, Mindy, and others in the community will be supporting fundraising activities over the next um, three to four months uh, to raise the additional dollars needed to implement this park in the spring of 2023. Uh, we also are submitting another grant application um, through Game Time, um, which is a, a national organization for playground equipment, and Matt's uh, submitting that uh, again this week. Uh, so we hope to have some good news on that as well. So the hope is, is that we can pull off a scrappy little project, pull it off with great community support and um, some good planning and design, and the park in that neighborhood will be will have a beautiful impact and we expect it to be a draw to the neighborhoods, the other neighborhoods as well here on the hilltop. Happy to take any questions. I, I just want to say I think this is a fantastic collaboration. Bill Barnes at Community Foundation has also been very helpful um, because we do need to fundraise in order to build the park out. We just think that is the right thing to do is we're changing our approach of how we you know, best leverage city dollars and state dollars uh, in order to get the greatest impact. And again, this is a neighborhood that has been underinvested in for probably 50, 50 years. Uh, it's a large neighborhood with, with, with both families and elderly living there. And so I think it's going to be a, just a transformation of the whole uh, community uh, in Oak Hill. Tony, is the Dalton Park part of the first or Mindy? section or is that like a second like it's not in the rendering but i know where it's supposed to go in the quadrant up here right yeah the rendering on the front uh, the rendering on the front is an example of the park from the park master plan uh, we are not doing the pickleball courts i should have been clear about that the dog park is going in there in the upper um, right hand quadrant and there'll be recreational equipment where the pickleball courts is um, uh, just various equipment in there that community can use soccer goal potentially and some other things like that and the parking did you say they requested parking were we able to work that in can we just not see it because of trees or? yeah it, it's not in this rendering but we basically on uh, help me out here Mindy. Uh, that's springwood springwood Meadow, no, i think this is meadowwood uh, on meadowwood we're gonna we're gonna have some parallel parking added along the edge of the perimeter of the park okay uh, which will be about six spaces which should help alleviate parking on the street, although parking on the street's fine in that community, it's, if we if we start to attract additional uh, residents coming to Oak Hill to enjoy the park, which we hope they do, uh, there'll be uh, dedicated spaces within the park. Okay, thank you. We're still finalizing uh, what specific pieces will be in there. We've talked about a permanent um, cornhole game, similar to what's down at JC Park. So there still may be some changes and additions and things going in there, but. All good, all good stuff. Is there any conversation about restrooms or some type of restroom facility for up there? No, I have not had that discussion. Uh, moving on to budget. I told you I thought I might be able to have some budget books for you, and I do. Um, budget workshops are Monday, I think, 530. That's what we decided on. We'll provide dinner for you and um, have Reedy Financial there to answer questions and go through an overview. And department heads will be there to answer questions. Um, I'm happy to take any questions in advance, especially by email would be great, so we can research and get the right answers for you and then uh, share them with everybody. But I would like to pass out budget books. These are draft, so if you find errors, or um, if there's, there's obviously going to be things we're going to move around and change. and. Some of the percentages may look a little off, and we'll be able to explain all that to you when we are in the workshop. So I'm going to pass those out to you right now before I sit down. That's all you got? All right. 
Mindy, thank you. Um, as she passes out the uh, budget books for next, next week's workshop, we do not have any bills on third reading, uh, but at this time we will recess the regular council meeting and call to order the public hearing regarding the additional appropriation for, thank you, Aviation Grant Matching Fund 367. Uh, Clerk Treasurer Rampy has been working with our uh, airport manager, Brent Spry, for this additional appropriation. Uh, we do have a sign-in sheet. Hopefully everybody has signed, that, uh, signed in and uh, returned to that because this is a public hearing requesting additional appropriation. I will turn the floor over to Katie and Brent to talk about the airport improvement project that brought us to, to this appropriation request. Mr. Mayor, we, we have not signed in. I oh, don't know. Okay. The sign in sheet's coming around. Yep. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. So I wanted uh, Brent to have the opportunity to explain to you what and where this uh, FFA or FAA grant originated from. So I will let him take the floor on that. This is just additional monies that we had for the fence project. It's just kind of drug out. We started it in uh, 2020. The grant uh, was in 2019, but of course you had to get the contractor there. So it started there. Of course we had the pandemic, so they had to leave, come back. So we're still in the process of closing this out. So um, as we're in the process of closing this out, we still have some additional monies. We, we do. <coughs> And again, the city's match was only uh, 249061. Um, the FAA's contribution was 44,830.98, and the state's um, match was the same as ours, the 249061. So, what what specifically is this additional match for? Um, really, just as far as the closeout. Sometimes there's overages in the project. So originally, when we would get the bids in. You are allowed allotted a certain amount for increases or changes, change orders, that sort of stuff, and so that's kind of what it is. Um, so it's it's all pieced together. Our consultants basically kind of take care of that portion of it. But um, we had a change in the fence where the gate went, the main gate. Um, as you know, everything looks good on paper until you start to build it, and then um, we had to move the fence back a little bit. Um, so there was some additional money in that where they had to drill down through the asphalt sort of stuff. Um, so that's kind of where some of this is coming from. You might, you might mention too just the scale of the uh, that project. It was a very large yeah, project. Yeah, $1.3 million. Dollars excuse me, go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted yeah, you. Yep, it was $1.3 million yep. dollars and 11,000 11, feet of fence. So. And I think it's worth noting here too that um, other than the small amount of city match funds that will be coming out of their NRO, it's all funded by either state or federal grants. Uh, it was a 95-5 type uh, funding, funding split. Any further questions? Any questions from the public? recess the hearing. Thank you. So we'll uh, close the public hearing. And Brent, I might ask you real quick, though, before you go, we'll close the public hearing. But I think it's a good opportunity to talk about the great things that are going on at the airport, and particularly uh, you hosted a big uh, Indiana aviation meeting recently. You want to tell council and community a little bit about what's going on out there? Yeah, so uh, we just recently uh, hosted the Aviation Indiana. It's an association that's basically all the airports in Indiana. There's 69 airports in uh, Indiana. So it's a good opportunity for us to kind of network with the different airports, see what they're doing. And then also with us hosting, they were able to come and see what we're doing out there. Um, we had many speakers, the mayor spoke. Uh, we had some of our consultants, uh, PHI, the air medical helicopter that we have out there, they spoke. Um, and Super TV spoke. You know, we, we kind of talked about the business development and kind of the ways that the airport is somewhat of a gateway to the community and how we kind of directly and indirectly uh, impact the, um, well, the basically the local town and the region. Um, so currently right now we have a project going on where we're replacing the asphalt in front of our um, fuel farm to concrete. It's 100 and 
$120,000 project, I believe it is. So it'd be eight inches of concrete, basically where we've been parking the jets. Um, they were starting to sink into the asphalt when it was hot. So mm -hmm. we're replacing that with concrete. Um, we have uh, some tree clearing to do in the, in the future. Um, we also have um, the air medical helicopters staying busy. So we're very happy with that. Fuel sales are going good. And um, we're getting ready for the air show September 24th. So we've got a uh, C-54 aircraft. It's a, um, um, it was a Berlin airlift uh, veteran and it's a uh, flying museum. So people will be able to go through that and see its role in the Berlin airlift. And we're hoping for some other Cool, cool rides and stuff like that as well. So. And you have the water project too. Yeah, we just finished the uh, water project. So we, um, if you come into the airport recently, it's all dug up. Mainly we had to replace the uh, main water line from a four inch to a six inch line. That one, it helps us with our fire, you know, uh, meat and fire code. And two, with the addition of our new hangar expansion area where PHI is now based. And we also have a couple other hangars there. Um, it starts giving us that um, extra flow that we'll need for when we expand later on. We have room for about 40 more hangars, so we're hoping to eventually start branching out that way. Did you say how many more hangars? 40 more hangars wow. that we could put in, yeah. Visit the airport. You'll be amazed. Uh, the hangar development, the, the work they've done, the service out there is fantastic. Just go hang out in the lounge, talk to the pilots as they come in. It's, it's fun. Thank you, Council. Brent, keep up the good job. All right, we've closed that uh, public hearing. Now we'll move on to a reconvening regular council meeting. Turn it back over to Joe. And related to um, what we just heard, this is an additional appropriation ordinance number 2022-11. Whereas it has been determined that it is now necessary to appropriate more money than was appropriated in the annual budget. Now, therefore, section one be resolved by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana. Civil City, Jefferson County, that for expenses of the taxing unit, the following additional sums of money are hereby appropriated out of the funds named and for the purposes specified subject to the laws governing the same. And that is the amount that we just discussed from the aviation grant of $49,812. Next ordinance on second reading is Ordinance number 2022-12, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, establishing the Nuisance Abatement Non-Reverting Fund. I'll ask uh, the next, uh, next three ordinances that are on second reading are originating out of building and planning. So Nicole is here to answer any questions you might have about purpose, the need, um, and, and uh, literally all, all, a lot of the work that's coming through building planning. Nicole, you just want me to go through all, yep. all of those and then you can answer questions in the back. Uh, another ordinance is ordinance number 22-13, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, establishing the Planning, Preservation, Design, Non-Reverting Fund. And ordinance number 2022-14, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, Indiana amending um, ordinance 96.99 of the city of Madison nuisances, health and safety, um, 98.06 of the city of Madison streets and sidewalks, 150.24 of the city of Madison building regulations, section 153 of the city of Madison subdivision regulations and section 155, section 11.60 of the city of Madison zoning and ordinance. So I'll kind of go through each one individually and answer questions as they come up. Uh, the first one for the nuisance abatement non-reverting fund. This is, um, I'm asking to, for this to be established because right now all of the funds that we collect from the property owners um, to pay for any of the city abatement goes into the unsafe building fund. It doesn't go back into paying the contractors. So we have to appropriate that funds just out of city funds instead of using the funds we already collect to cover our fees. Uh, so that's the purpose of that um, NRO. The second NRO um, asking uh, for the creation just for our general department. 
Uh, right now, all of our uh, funds that come in from um, any of our fees, uh, fines, uh, just go into the general fund. Um, this fund would allow us to cover costs like um, professional services rather than it just being allocated from the general fund. Um, this would still be appropriated um, through the council process. It's a non-reverting fund. Why, why do you feel a non-reverting fund is necessary for that rather than just asking for an appropriation during the budget each year? Um, there are uh, many other departments that have NROs and this is established to be similar to those. Um, our fees um, collected are through our department and just felt they should be used for our department. Yeah, I would say this is similar to the approach we've taken in parks, you know, where we want, we want, you know, some of these departments that are really based on services for specific users to be operated more like a bu business or where we can track the revenue and, exp and expenditures there. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities, candidly, with the appropriation process because even though we're trapping the money, it will still go through an appropriations process from a budget perspective but we'll be specifically dedicating that money for building and planning. And there's needs that come up, you know, throughout the course of the year. Building and planning has expanded dramatically um, relative to the professionalism that's there, the staffing is required to process the number of applications. Uh, you'll see or have seen hopefully through, you know, ready and uh, design guidelines, the updated survey, uh, comprehensive planning, closing out stellar, all the different projects, everything goes through the planning office. So it's uh, a very important um, department that literally touches almost everything that we do. And so these reverting funds will allow us to just specifically, you know, dedicate the monies that they raise through penalties, fines, uh, or fees, for example, to stay in building and planning to help building and planning. So do we believe that these monies, these fees, penalties, fines, et cetera, will be enough to uh, fully fund the the the, the, the area, the department. It won't. It won't be enough to fully fund um, that. And we can talk more about that. And when we talk about the next one, our fees do not currently cover even our salaries. So you, you'll still be using money from general funds. Yes. It will just will will ask for less in our budget than currently allocated. Yeah, and, and the ultimate goal here, right, is to um, have more revenue generated where the use is occurring. That will then free up more of, of our levy and other forms of revenue for general fund operations. See, that doesn't quite make sense to me because these funds currently go into the general fund, so this doesn't free up any additional funding. Well, general fund is comprised of maybe a yeah. dozen well, or more. I mean, sp specifically that's, speaking that's about this, saying. though. No, what I'm saying is that if that can operate more independently with more of its own revenue, then that frees up other sources to allocate in the other parts of the general okay. fund. And maybe, maybe I should pause there and just mention what's in the general fund, okay? That may help you here. Uh, currently what's funded out of the general fund in addition to uh, building and planning is mayor's office, clerk treasurer, city council, board of public works, economic development, police, fire, law department, community outreach, and then uh, that's, those are basically the you know, 10 or so aspects of the general fund. So whatever, and this will be part and parcel to the next part of the conversation about raising additional revenues to help support building and planning. You know, only about 60% of our entire budget comes from property tax levy, so we're reliant on other forms of revenue to support our budget. You'll hear more about that, you know, next week when we do the budget workshop. So that's why all of this conversation, you know, is happens, happening simultaneously because, you know, there's a lot of pressure on our general fund to support other parts of the city's operations. Uh, some of those are not revenue producing at all. They're just uh, uh, get appropriated monies from our tax levy and other forms of revenue to support its operation, but they're not revenue generating. The approach we've taken over the last couple of years is 
where there's a revenue generating opportunity, we want to try to trap those funds to support that particular activity. Um, you've heard us talk a lot about the parks where campground might be making $100,000 a year, but it's offsetting deficits in other parts of the parks. Well, uh, the end result of all that in the parks was you couldn't maintain anything because none of the money that was being created was actually being reinvested in the part of parks that was actually producing the revenue. We're reinvesting in building and planning because that part of our operation is growing. It's very labor intensive. We're not even close to covering our costs, um, but you know it's been five years or so since fees have been addressed. And uh, now I think that Nicole's making some really reasonable recommendations for, for that. Any other questions or public comments on those two before I move on to the final one? So your, uh, the final ordinance is um, asking for modifications to our fee structures. Uh, you'll have Appendix A, um, we sent out an update with justifications on those fee raisings um, or changes. Um, primarily, the uh, request is to help cover city costs. As I mentioned earlier, our fees do not currently cover uh, even the cost the city has into it just with staff time. Uh, for example, uh, our BZA applications uh, take about uh, two to three hours to process each application um, at $19 an hour that's $114 of city cost to uh, process a, a BZA application and that's just for one staff person so that's not including um, my time if uh, I need to get involved with that application um, where I'm requesting that application fee to be increased um, only slightly not to the $114. There's a couple other application fees uh, that you'll see that were zero uh, that we're asking for um, fees to help cover. One is a late renewal payment fee for conditional use permits. We have a couple of conditional use permits um, that routinely are not paid on time and we are covering the cost for those re-advertisements and that's all that we're asking to be covered in that proposed fee. Um, is to cover the advertisement fee that we have into it. Um, other costs um, include uh, appeals fee. Uh, we hadn't had that historically. Uh, this year we've had three appeals before BZA um, of which we've um, taken all of the advertising fee on ourselves. The biggest change that you'll see in this fee structure is for our building permits. Right now they're based on a estimated cost of construction which can get very confusing for the general public. It's a cost based on each thousand dollars and it goes up from there. We have a great um, building permit calculator in the office, but the general public can't figure <coughs> out how to do it themselves. I don't blame them because I don't do it by hand either. I use that uh, calculator that was created for us. So we're recommending some flat fees for uh, general items like just foundation permits or if you're just upgrading your electric um, and then a cost per um, square foot uh, for any new or remodels. And that's the same for both residential and commercial, they're just different fees set up. The other fee that we're adding is a reinspection fee. Uh, currently we don't have any cost uh, or any fees uh, to go out and reinspect. Uh, that would be issued if a contractor calls, sets up, let's say, a footer inspection. Our building inspector goes out and they're not ready. We want to make sure that they're scheduling their um, inspections when they need them, not just calling and taking up city time um, when they're not ready. And the other biggest change on here um, is print cost for our new scanner. Um, in January we uh, purchased a large format scanner and right now we don't have any fees associated for the use of that through other departments or um, external. So those are uh, that big list of um, additional fees. So you're, you will, it's intended that you'll charge the other departments to print something on that large printer? Yes, that is the intention uh, because 
Uh, we are um, in charge of all of the fees associated with it, print, paper, maintenance, and it's quite costly. Just one of those ink cartridges is over $100. Do the other departments charge? I mean, the, the copier that sits outside of Tammy's area out there, do the departments pay to use that? Uh, I don't know. The budget, the budget for each department. Budget for each department uh, office. And then, again, maybe I'll use this as an analogy, which is for the water <coughs> department, we all pay for our own water. So it, this isn't an uncommon practice of trying to you know, segregate your costs by department so you can have a better understanding of what it costs to operate that department. Sounds like an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy to me to be charging departments within city government fees for things that they may not really need a lot of. I, I, I mean, my response to that would be if, if you don't, if you don't know what it costs to operate a department, how are you ever going to address proper fee structure, taxation, revenue generation, grant administration? There's a lot of costs. So yeah, um, yeah. You're, you're right. This may sound, and, and I mean, I wouldn't want to take that one part of this presentation and say there's this, all this bureaucracy that's happening across the department. It goes, I can tell you the number of times I've gone into the building planning office and said, hey, can you copy this? Is probably zero. Uh, I'm sure it happens, but it's not not that often. Um, but uh, there's a almost a hundred different things here that the Coles department has to manage that's on this sheet, and uh, that's why you know, if we don't every few years take a professional uh, review of it, then I think what we'll end up doing is not making the proper adjustments in order to cover our costs or not have a good understanding of what it costs us to provide a service. <laughs> and will their department keep track of fees and like who's saying hey you owe this amount we, we would yeah we would bill in between the departments so like we have a list uh, for example right now the only de other department that's used our plotter is economic development uh, for the redevelopment of uh, Madison Plaza we would just send them an invoice uh, similar to any other business. And then ultimately it would be just moved from one fund to another? Is that how the payment would be made? Yeah? This is a pretty common There's accounting a practice. Yeah. This is what happens in businesses across the country. I mean, you. For our service department, you know, we, it's just to track expenses and, and who's covering those costs. And as the mayor said, w the city already has that practice of doing that for other. A situation is just like I have two vehicles that my staff uses. I pay the street department for that use for the of, fuel. of fuel or um, maintenance. Some of the other fee increase, I don't know if anybody has anything else on that matter. Um, the other fee increases, um, like the, the new application fee for um, Historic District Board of Review. Um, I have a hard time supporting something like that because I, I feel like the goal should be to encourage the public to utilize that process. And when you start tacking fees onto it, I think you're going to just further discourage people from wanting to present their plans and receive advice. And so Historic District Board of Review already has an application fee itself. It's just listed as an ad fee. Um, this it, The additional fee is to help cover city cost um, in terms of staff time. For example, uh, just last year we had uh, 73 historic board applications go to historic district board. That's not including the 91 that staff reviewed. So the ones that staff review still won't be charged a fee? Uh, we're recommending a lower fee of $10. I, 
I, I, I feel that for, for property owners, specifically in, in involving a lot to do with, with planning department fees, we pay our property taxes twice a year, and it helps fund city government in a lot of ways. And, and city government can operate as a business, but at the end of the day, it's not a business. And so trying to recoup full fees based on time, it, it, property taxes are already subsidizing the costs that go into all of these. So uh, they, they, a lot of them, and, and a lot of them seem high. And also it goes back to my, my original point of, of wanting to encourage people to actually utilize the process. Yep, I totally understand um, that point of view. We're not asking to cover all of our fees, our cost into it. Uh, for example, historic board, the recommended fee to cover all of our costs would be $95. I'm asking for 25. And I would, I would just say that the city is absolutely business. Um, it's multifaceted. It's involved in so many things that move the community and the region forward. Uh, it's incumbent on us to be prudent managers of the scarce resources that we have because the demands on the city uh, candidly have never been greater, particularly coming through a pandemic. We saw during the pandemic um, what uh, additional resources were required of, uh, of the city, um, the business community, the tourism community, uh, public health uh, initiatives. There were so many different things that we had to do. And uh, the only way to you know, make sure that we can strategically and tactically move the city forward is to manage it like a business because these are scarce funds. We're always out there looking for more resources because we're doing more and more. And um, that's why I think this is a, it's a prudent review, but we absolutely need to uh, manage the city, manage city finances like a business. One further question regarding copies. Um, and Joe, this would be for you. Is there any cap on by state law on copy costs? I know with Freedom of Information Act requests, I thought there were, but. Yeah. Yeah, there is something in there that talks about um, freedom of, with regard to public records requests on, I believe, what you can charge um, per copy. Um, I don't think that there is anything that as it relates to, um, to this necessarily. Okay. Um, I would say it would be probably a good idea if they aligned. If um, you're, are you referring to the cost for zoning ordinance? subdivision regulations, those costs? Those and just generally throughout. So those the are the costs. number of pages based by a dollar, at, which is listed below for the cost of a document. I have not changed that fee. I just increased those uh, because that's what it would cost if you requested it via document. Asking somebody to pay $150 for a copy of an ordinance seems a little extreme as well. They could always print it themselves. It's available, so it's available online. online. It is. It is. But, I mean, some people don't have printers, and if they would like to request a copy, it's a bit extreme. I do have a note, uh, just a typographical thing. In the, the text of the ordinance, it doesn't reference the Section 155 before section 111.60 the sorry the final 114 it's just missing section 155 in front of section 11.60 so i would motion to amend the ordinance to add section 155 in front of section 11.60 Yeah, I just a typographical error. It doesn't require a motion. We need a motion to amend. Oh, let's just go ahead and put it there. Yeah. I don't mind. I, 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 it's probably a scrivener's error. Um, we have a motion. No, we have a second. Just a second. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any other questions?
questions from council? Public. That will move on to third reading. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Open up the floor to anybody who would like to address council and mayor's office. Please come to the podium and uh, state your uh, name and address and provide your comments. All right. Oh, may I ask you to come up to the podium, Mayor Lisa, so you, we'll catch you also on film. I'm going to lighten the mood for y'all. So I retired from the school system. Every grade level was allowed so much laminating. You had to measure about the foot and write it down, and your grade level had to pay for it. You were allotted so many copies per grade level. If you went over, then it came out of your own pocket. So that's how, that's how government was run in the public education spectrum. So just think. It might sound tedious and narrow-minded to you all, but I was quite used to going, I'm five foot, this is the laminating, five more foot, five more foot. So lighten the load, and let's just go home happy, right? Let's see. And, and while I'm talking to Mindy, I always want to say, when y'all are doing the budget, please just keep thinking about lights, lights, and more lights. I really wish we'd had security cameras in a lot of these places around town. So start thinking of that, because I've been talking with the mayor today about some security issues. So I'm always talking to Mindy about lights, lights. The fountain's lit up. It's beautiful. Just go home saying the fountain's beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to address mayors or uh, city council? I will just give you a couple of updates. Um, as you know, in July, we presented you an update with the uh, ARPA plan. We're expecting the second installment by the end of August, so we are working on an amendment to that plan that will incorporate recommendations on uh, the appropriation of the second tranche of monies, which will be approximately $1,338,000. Uh, we'll bring those recommendations to you. I would also like uh, at the August 16th or maybe the first you know, August 16th meeting, go over with you priorities for the balance of the year. We have a tremendous amount of work going on in all the departments. and. Um, there's a lot we need to accomplish by the end of this year. I want to share with you what those priorities are, and I would also invite council uh, to contact me if there are some additional priorities you would like to be see incorporated in for 2022, and then we'll also be carrying forward um, priorities for 2023, part of which was Nicole had mentioned on the planning side, and then when Tony presents the uh, capital project plan after uh, next week's redevelopment commission meeting we'll also share with you all the great things that's going on in economic development because it is it's very impressive the amount of partnerships and collaborations that are happening across the community um, she mentioned ready um, and then uh, we gave an update on aviation uh, I would also uh, in the near future within the next two weeks we're going to bring uh, to Parks Board and to Council uh, continued restoration plan for Crystal Beach. As you know, we are uh, probably over 90% complete on the pool house. Um, it's a little delayed because of supply chain issues, but um, by next month we'll be opening up the pool house for year-round use. If you haven't had an opportunity to take a tour of Crystal Beach lately, let us know. Let uh, Tony or Nicole know and we'll get you a tour of that because the, the new renovations of the pool house look fantastic we've been working with uh, okra our uh, one of our grant providers uh, and the redevelopment commission which was providing additional financing for the project to bifurcate uh, the pool house from the pool and um, you know we have been working with engineering structural engineers and consultants on the pool basin itself uh, we'll bring a full report to council and the parks parks department or Parks Board uh, to talk about uh, the uh, restoration of the swimming pool. Um, we have been, you know, certainly, you know, looking not only at the basin condition but the mechanical conditions, 
Uh, we had a meeting here this week with our pool consultants that uh, uh, really shed some light, additional light on the condition of the pool and, um, and some suggestions on moving forward. So it's very complicated. It's taking a lot of time because we're being thoughtful about it. It's an iconic uh, landmark for the city of Madison, but what we'll be bringing to you is uh, a restoration plan, a financial plan, as well as uh, the, the vehicle in which we intend to finance the improvements to the pool so we can have a 2023 pool season. So a lot of work's being done there, uh, a lot of heavy lifting, uh, candidly, being, being done by many, many people uh, in order to preserve that pool and, and get it ready for 2023. I'll uh, pause there and see if council has any questions of me or if council has anything they want to add. Uh, the next meeting is Tuesday, August the 16th, 530. Hearing none, we'll take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I second the motion. All fair, please say aye. 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 Council, thank you. We'll see you uh, next Monday. <laughs>